I know that some of you have already picked up a copy of the calendar for the Bible reading for February. But if you haven't, and you are reading through the Bible, the, um, the <clears throat> calendar is there on the, the table uh, by the doors. Um, so, going well. I'm, I'm happy to be able to say I'm up to date on my reading. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. So the February calendar is there by the door. Um, <clears throat> there are some... Um, Basketball games in Sterling tomorrow afternoon. Uh, I don't know just what times. Is it um, 4 and 5.30? 5, 5, 4 and 5.15? Good. Good. Real good. If you're at all able to make it, um, come down and uh, cheer the kids on to some, um, some uh, big victories. Amen? Amen? Always good. Always a good time to, you know, of course, when we're in Sterling there, um, good time with the, uh, the brothers and sisters in the Lord as well. I wanted to uh, remind everybody to make sure if you haven't signed up for the, uh, the anniversary celebration on March 19th, make sure and do so. Uh, need to sign up by the, ninth, excuse me, by the end of the month, which is Tuesday. Tuesday is January 31st, so we've got to sign up by then. If you haven't done so, uh, do so uh, later on today when you go home, open up your email Check the link that you got from your deacons or from, from Jim. And um, uh, it is, uh, for those of you who have not uh, gone to that link and looked at the, the invitation, let me just mention that, it is, that it's on several pages. Um, uh, you're supposed to take some time, go through it all. Uh, will you be attending the morning uh, service? Will you be attending the meal? Will you be attending the afternoon service? Will you be there for the refreshments after the after afternoon service? Four get-togethers, they want to hear from you on each one. How many people are coming from your party, okay? Good, so make sure and, um, and uh, get each page before you hit that submit button. All righty? And it um, should be a wonderful time of, of uh, just celebrating together with our brothers and sisters there in Sterling and... Uh, just uh, remembering the great ways in which uh, pastor has been uh, used in our lives over the last 50 years. Whoa, that's a good long time, isn't it? Hallelujah. Turn with me in your Bibles this afternoon over to Ephesians chapter 4. And um, got something to write down for your memory work for this week? Okay, we're going to do the passage that we looked at some this morning from Luke chapter 6. And don't anybody fuss and say that it's a little longer verse. I know that it's a little longer verse, but it's not too difficult. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is... See that? You're on your, right on your way to having it memorized already. That's not hard, is it? And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is... See? You're good. You're good. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So we need to keep our heart with all diligence, don't we? Making sure that it is God's word that is hidden in our heart, that his word is dwelling in our hearts richly. That's what will come out of our mouths. We will be speaking and declaring in agreement with what God has to say, what is his heart. So that's Luke 6, 45. And then the other one we'll take from the, the Hebrews passage. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, <clears throat> 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. That's Luke, excuse me, Hebrews 10, verse 23. Amen? Hallelujah. <clears throat> we talk of... having our profession line up with what God has to say. We don't want to be found in conflict with God. In Ephesians chapter 4, let's jump right on in, where the scripture says in verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. He goes on, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, 
whereby ye were sealed, ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Uh, you know Ephesians 4 to be a passage of scripture that speaks uh, just above this about the edification that takes place when the members of the body, members in particular, bring ministry to one another. The body makes increase of itself in love, doesn't it? And then he goes on and he talks here in this passage and he just gives some rather general instructions to be uh, given attention, to be observed that uh, this edification of the body might proceed in a good and normal and healthy way. He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. We want to talk a little bit about, as we start this afternoon, talk about corrupt communication. Uh, we should not limit our understanding of corrupt communication as just uh, uh, what is, is, is commonly called cussing, you know, just uh, vulgarity or profanity, okay? Right, that's not the, uh, the full extent of corrupt communication. Uh, certainly you, you know that the Bible has a, a fair amount to say about uh, uh, the, the need to be very careful not to engage in gossip. Uh, speaking evil of one another. That's corrupt communication. But in a broader sense still, we could consider corrupt communication to be anything that, that is, again, inconsistent with the word of God. Unholy talk. It's sure not pleasing to the Lord. I think the Lord would categorize it as corrupt communication, even if maybe that broad an application isn't found in this particular context. No corrupt communication. We would recognize that when we're speaking the word, we're speaking the truth in love to one another, then we, uh, then we can edify one another. And I would ask uh, that we would consider that maybe um, <clears throat> uh, Paul is talking very broadly about the attitudes that we give place to, the things that we allow out of our mouths that might not fall into the category of, of gossip, but look, at, as he goes on, he says, let all bitterness and wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. He's talking about things that are, in part, that are coming out of our mouths. Amen? Not all bitterness and wrath and anger is necessarily articulated, but he speaks of, uh, of clamor and evil speaking. That's coming out of the mouth, isn't it? And what's in abundance in the mouth, uh, excuse me, what's in abundance in the heart will come out of the mouth. So no corrupt communication. Amen? Amen. Which would include criticism of others. You know, people, um, <clears throat> um, I was listening to a teaching. You know, I've mentioned that I've listened to some uh, uh, older teachings of pastors. And, uh, and um, he was telling of how he, um, <clears throat> uh, he had uh, somewhere been watching a show or listening to somebody talk of how uh, the little figures or little expressions that we use, you know, where they've come from. The one that he was referring to, um, uh, uh, bless his heart, you know, or, or I think it was, yeah, bless his heart, or God bless him, something like that. And um, this, this individual was saying that that's their favorite, you know, bless his heart, uh, because they heard a preacher one time say that you can say anything nasty about somebody just so long as you conclude it with bless his heart. <laughs> <laughs> he went on and used the example. <clears throat> he said, you know, uh, uh, one of, the, one of the, 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 the girls talking with another girl, you know, she says, you know, uh, I know. Uh, she can't help that she's so ugly. But she didn't have to come out in public. Bless her heart. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <clears throat> uh, folks say all kinds of nasty things, uh, critical of one another. Uh, uh, we have uh, the potential of speaking that which is, is uh, edifying, strengthening, encouraging, don't we? And that's all 
part of, um, part of our own profession. We can, we can take a stand and make a declaration of what we are trusting Father to do in our lives and on our behalf, and that can serve to edify others, can't it? To help them. Um, you know how it affects you when you're around somebody who is, is strong spiritually, taking a good stand of faith, holding fast to a profession of faith without wavering. It edifies you. It encourages you to follow that example. If they can stand strong on the word of God, then bless God, in the circumstances that I face, I too can be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I can say what God has to say about me and my situation, just like my brother is doing, my sister is doing, as they face the trials they have before them. Good to the use of edifying. No corrupt communication, whether it be speaking critically or, or in some way disparagingly about uh, uh, another brother or sister or complaining about our own situation. That's all corrupt communication, isn't it? And should be given no place in our lives. Let's go over to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. About half the chapter is, is, is uh, uh, <clears throat> committed to the tongue, isn't it? And we'll pick it right up at verse 1 of James chapter 3. He says, and I read from the New King James, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Well, here, <clears throat> James says that uh, the guy that can contain the tom tongue is the perfect guy. That's the, that's the measure that, uh, that he is using, isn't he? If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. You can get the, if you get that down, hey, the rest is like, you know, just a piece of cake compared to taming the tongue. I can keep under my body. I can, I can rein in my thoughts, but control the tongue. Now, that's another, that's another story, isn't it? That's what he's saying here. All kinds of, of other temptations are, are, are less, uh, <clears throat> or maybe less uh, vulnerable in those areas. But controlling the tongue, that's a perfect person that can do that. Able to bridle the whole body. He goes on, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at, at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. So he uses a, a couple of helpful examples, doesn't he, of how big things can be controlled by a little member, by a little part. And just a little, a little fire can kindle a big mess, can it? <clears throat> no man can tame her. I like the, uh, the, you know, the, the bit in the horse's mouth. Control the mouth of that big animal. And you can make that thing go wherever you want it to, can't you? Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Well, we took some time this morning, we talked about the link between the tongue and the heart, didn't we? Yep. See, it's not coming out of your mouth if it's not in your heart in the first place. If the complaint, the criticism, uh, the, the self-indulgence that is behind always talking fear and negativity. You with me there? 
You know, when somebody is just talking negative, well, that they are work. If they're a Christian, they are working and fighting against the work of the Holy Spirit in them, because the Holy Spirit is encouraging them from within to take a stand of faith, isn't he? Isn't he? Sure, he is. He knows what we should be saying. He knows how we should be thinking. He knows how we should be bringing our thoughts and our emotions into line with what is written. Every thought captive. He knows that. And he knows when we give place to thinking negatively, the complaint, the criticism. He knows that. He knows it before it comes out of our mouth. We ought to know it when it does come out of our mouth. We can hear it with our ears, as can those around us. He, <clears throat> he says the fire is a world of iniquity, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body, sets on fire the course of nature. Through the words that we speak, we're declaring what we believe, how we view things, and we're really uh, declaring what course we're on. We chuckled a little bit about the, the positive thinking, positive confession that, that is exploited by the, the secular uh, realms of, uh, of, uh, of confession or uh, self-help. And there is a power in that. These declarations of self-confidence and self-reliance and independence. There's a power in that. How much greater the power there is when the confession is the word of God, aligned with what God has said, what he has written, what his heart for us is, what his wisdom is in the situations that we face. Just a little member. But we set our courses that way, don't we? I can choose to say, there's no hope. And in so doing, I'm essentially just laying down and quitting, aren't I? Aren't I? I mean, I forsake my, my own opportunity, what, what might be there as an opportunity for me to make a go of it, but I say there's no hope. I've effectively quit, haven't I? Yeah. But when we line up our profession with what God says, there's hope. There is that favorable, confident expectation. I don't see how it's going to work on out, but I've not abandoned uh, any, any hopes of things working out favorably. I don't understand. It looks, it's a sure a whole lot bigger than, than, than me. And I've never seen anything like, you know, God do something this big on my behalf before. But I know he is well able. And I know that he's a good God. And he hears my prayer and he knows what's good for me. So I'm not going to cast away all confidence. No. I'm going to stand on his word. I'm going to hold fast. And see his salvation. We don't, we don't quit. We don't uh, give up. We don't lose heart. We don't lose hope. But the tongue who says... Uh, it's useless, things will never change, it'll never get any better, or I'm no good, I'm a failure, or, yeah, as we said this morning, we're all going to die. <laughs> uh, we forsake the mercy that belongs to us, don't we? Like that passage says, those that regard lying vanities, Right? Those that look at the circumstances which speak against the truth of God's word. They forsake their own mercy. If I place greater stock in what I see with my eyes and I understand with my pea brain, if I place greater stock in that than what the Bible has to say, then I forsake my own mercy. Any hope of God moving on my behalf. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Every kind of beast and bird and of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man 
can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Whether we bless God, our Father, God and our Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. So we gather at a time like this and we have a good time lifting our voices to praise God, don't we? Yeah, love to sing your praises, my sweet Savior. Right? Love to sing those songs. Right? Mm -hmm. And then we turn around and say what? Yeah, we're all going to die. No hope. Yeah, sure would have been nice if God come through for me once in a while. Yeah. And we give place to those things in our thoughts. We allow those things out of our mouth. You know, my husband's a jerk. Still. Always has been, probably always will be. Therewith bless we God, and there we curse we men. Therewith curse we men who have been made in the similitude of God. These things ought not so to be. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So if, if we are abiding in Jesus and his word is abiding in us, then what's coming out of our mouths is his word. Blessings. Amen? Truths from his word upon which we stand and, and, and wherewith we edify our brothers and sisters. It is only by the grace of God that <clears throat> we can tame the tongue. Let's look over to... Um, I'd like to take a look at a few biblical examples of, of corrupt communication. People saying what they ought not to say. Go with me over to Numbers 13. This is the children of Israel murmuring. You say, Pastor, that's, you know, that's all the Exodus and Numbers, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, just about. But here in Exodus 13, uh, we find the account of the return of the 12 spies from having searched out the land of Canaan. We'll pick it up right at verse 25. We're going to read a, a fair amount here. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel. You know the story. The 12 spies have been sent by Moses into Canaan to search out the land before the children of Israel enter the promised land. They're still in the wilderness. Unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us. And surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Off to a good start. Nevertheless, uh-oh, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Those are the giants. Those are, uh, you know, Goliath's relatives. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea, by the coast of Jordan. And by the coast of Jordan. Well, Caleb sees this heading in a not-so-good direction, doesn't he? Started out, okay, we've searched out the land. It's, um, it's a goodly land. Here's the fruit of it, but. And so then they go on and they talk about all the inhabitants. All of them, lots of them, walled cities go up to heaven. And there are giants in the land. And everywhere you go, there are, there are people. So Caleb stills the people before Moses. And he says what? Let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. Well, 
That's a good profession of faith, isn't it? That's a good profession of faith. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report. Here they're looking at the same data, same set of circumstances, the same conditions, aren't they? But their take is quite different. Ten of them say, we're not able. They're stronger than we are. Two say, we are well able. Let us go up at once. Well, you know, every Christian has a choice. They can choose to look at the circumstances and think that, yeah, this is, um, this is too hard, uh, too much, it's hopeless, we're all going to die. <clears throat> or we can look to the word of God and say what the word of God has to say. That if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? And the contrast is just, I mean, it's just beautiful the way it's brought out here. Because you got two opposing voices, don't you? Looking at the same set of circumstances. And one group see, uh, chooses to say, we can't, we are not able, they're stronger, they're mightier than we are. And another group, another two, just two say, we are well able, let us go up at once. And we'll find ourselves there. That is, find ourselves having to make some choices about what we're going to allow out of our mouths, how we're going to read. What we're, hey, we're all looking at the same set of circumstances. And one can be very negative and very pessimistic, and one can be very positive uh, based upon God's word, his promises, his perspective. And we're just choosing. Who are we going to believe? What are we going to believe? What will we profess? They brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in, in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Well, some of them have that perspective. But not everybody saw themselves as grasshoppers. Or maybe some of themselves, you know, okay, these guys are bigger than they are, but we can still take them. Just because they're taller doesn't mean that they're, they're going to win, does it? No, no. If God be for us. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would God we had died in this wilderness. Well, you know how, uh, how this goes. How this, this particular story ends, doesn't it? It's at this point God says, okay, you're not going in. Isn't it? Yeah. I thought we'd use this as an opportunity, you know, just to go over a little bit of the ground that you've covered here if you've been reading through your Bible so far. Okay? You keep a finger here. We may come back to it, you know. Um, may not. But look with me back over to Genesis. Go with me to Genesis. Go with me over to chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And look at a few passages of scripture with me, would you? In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Now you keep going with me, now go over to chapter 13. And look at me down to 14 and 15 of Genesis 13 now. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward 
and southward and eastward and westward for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. So God's talking to Abram, isn't he? All righty. Ready? Go over to chapter 15. Verse 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Now, could me down a little further here in 15 to 12 and following. And when the sun had gone down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. They shall afflict them <clears throat> 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. And in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between these, those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the <clears throat> Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the uh, Gergesites and the Jebusites. All that land. Good there? Promising them to give them the land. The people will go down, be there for 400 years as slaves. Go with me over to 24. Genesis 24. This, re this is just repeated over and over again. To Abraham, now to... <clears throat> uh, Abraham repeats it himself as he sends his servant to take a, <clears throat> a bride for his son. He says to his servant, verse 7 of 24, The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me and swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before me, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son. So again, Abraham is standing on this promise, isn't he? God has repeated it to him several times. And now he is saying that this is the way it's going to be. This land has been promised to us by God. Right? And we take this time, and we're going to look at a few more here before we, uh, <clears throat> before we leave Genesis. But over and over again, as it's recorded in the scripture, the promise comes to Abraham, comes to Isaac, comes to Jacob. This is going to be your land. And then who are the children of Israel? Having, they've been down in, in Egypt for what? 400 years. Now they're coming and out. They've seen the mighty end of God. Amen? Yes? And now God's bringing, he's about to bring them in. And what are they doing? They're saying, can't do it. Can't do it. All these promises are coming to, to, to pass. They are being fulfilled right before their very eyes. And they say, it is impossible. Just look with me to a couple more. Uh, uh, Genesis 26, 24, where the Lord uh, appears to Isaac or visits Isaac. The previous ones were Abram. This is now Isaac. 26, verse 24. The Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father, fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abram's sake. And there he builded an altar. <clears throat> and then... In 28, 13, uh, 
This is Jacob, as, is, as Jacob is uh, uh, fleeing from his own, own land. Verse 13, Behold, the Lord stood above it, above the ladder, said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And uh, he just keeps telling them, this is your land. I'm going to give it to you. And now the people of Israel are right on the edge of the land, about to go on in, and they say, we can't do it. That's corrupt communication. And we take the time just to, I hope, in our hearts, underscore the point that God has given to us more than ample reason to believe him. He's true to his word. We're, we're staking our eternal future on the belief that God indeed sent his only begotten son in human form to die with our sin. He rose from the dead and in so doing and through that redemptive work now offers to us everlasting life, forgiveness of sins, the restoration of a right relationship with him and everlasting life with him. You believe that to be true? I mean, that's the, that's the basis for our Christianity, isn't it? Should we doubt anything else that God has said? Should we call into question any other promises that he has made? Presumably, we're, 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 we're going to live forever, right? We say we're going to live forever because of what God has done on our behalf. Did you ever see Jesus? Did you see him dying on the cross? Did you see his blood spilt? Did you see that blood in, in the spirit realm washing you of, of free of your sins? But you hold that to be true. And it is true. And God's made it true to you in, his, in your spirit, by his spirit. And are we going to speak against God regarding any other area of our lives? What he has said is ours, belongs to us, the grace to overcome besetting sin. His promises of a, of a good future. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Not of evil, but of good to give you a good or a desirable end. That's what he says. I know the thoughts that I'm thinking about you. Are you willing to get into agreement with me? Because that's really where it, what it comes down to, isn't it? Are you willing to let me bless you? How about that? Are you willing? Because how much did they have to do going into the promised land? Hmm? March around Jericho, blow some horns, shout with a great shout. God's doing all the work, isn't he? They had to fight, but God goes before them, defeating their enemies. I don't know that there's a single Israelite that died at Jericho. No record of it, is there? That battle? How many casualties on each side? Well, inhabitants of Jericho, 100%. How many casualties uh, among the Israelite armies? Zero. Our God is well able. Is well able. Here in this account, we see, you know, well, we, we didn't read it, but... I'm pretty sure that most are familiar with the story when they murmured against God and said that we are not able. They are standing uh, at the, the outskirts of the land that God had promised to them for generations, hundreds of years. And before their very eyes, they have seen the mighty hand of God move to bring them out of Egypt, destroying the Egyptians. They come out with a spoil of Egypt. And God has already provided for them some in the wilderness, like water from a rock. Amen? Yeah, I mean, they, they saw the, the sea part and, and, and they walked through the myth of the sea on dry ground. They seen the hand of God as the plagues came to Egyptians and God made a distinction between the land of Goshen and the rest of the land of Egypt, didn't he? Yeah. And now they say, nope, nope. God can't bring us into this land. That's not a pleasing thing to God. With many of them, God was not well pleased. Our profession should line up with what God has proclaimed. Amen? What God says he's going to do, what he says belongs to us, that's what we should be saying. 
There should be no murmuring and complaining. Really bringing an indictment against God, saying he can't. He's not able. It's too hard for the Lord. <clears throat> Look at me to do uh, Numbers 16. Another example of corrupt communication, the kind, of, the kind of communication we want to stay way away from. This is uh, the rebellion of Korah and Dathan and Abiram. From verse 1, now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and An, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, they took men, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. They gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Now they're now going to complain against the leadership, aren't they? This is corrupt communication. They're talking against the, the man of God. And in critical, he's, they're critical of the, the job that he is doing as their leader. They're still in the wilderness at this point because of the complaint. Uh, the, you know, the ten spies brought up an evil report. But the congregation didn't all have to embrace that. Isn't it sad? I mean, that's terrible. But it should be a reminder to us how, how defiling corrupt communication can be. What if those 12 spies were united in bringing back a good report? How likely is it that all the congregation would have said, we don't believe you? We're not able. If there had been a unified voice among those 12 spies that searched out the land, history might have been written a little differently. But the evil report had a defiling and corrupting influence on the whole congregation because all the rest of them were ready to listen to the evil report. And so now they're still in the wilderness and, uh, and, and now people are complaining about the leadership, aren't they? Korah, who is a Levite, who has been given the privilege of ministering before the Lord, and these others of, of the tribe of Reuben. You know, there's nothing in there, but you know, Reuben was the... You know this one from, from your reading here, right? Reuben is who? He's the oldest, isn't he? He's the eldest. He's the firstborn to Leah, isn't he? Yeah? He's the first of all those 12. Reuben's the oldest. And so, you know, there's maybe some sway, some influence there among these elders. And you know how this story goes also, don't you? This is where the ground opens up and swallows them. Opens up, swallows them, and all that pertained unto them. And closes back up. Yeah. Moses just stands up there. Listen, if I go the way of the grave, if I go the way of all men, then you know that I wasn't speaking for God. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. But if God does a new thing and opens up the ground today and swallows these men up, then you know that I'm speaking for God. And the ground opens up and swallows them up because of their evil speaking. Corrupt communication. You take too much on yourself. We don't like your, your, your leadership style. You're not getting the job done. And here, uh, they had a lot of good history with this man Moses already, didn't they? Yeah. Hadn't been for Moses. Moses was just being used of the Lord. But um, they'd still be slaves in Egypt, wouldn't they? But Moses, again, in his sovereignty, just um, Moses was willing to be used, and he was mightily used because he was willing to be used. And they complained against him. That's corrupt communication, the kind we need to stay way away from. So whether it be, you know, the complaining that we do about, uh, you know, uh, why do we have to come on out to corporate prayer? I have to corporate prayer. What's the big deal about corporate prayer? I can pray at home. God's everywhere. He hears me wherever I am. Why not pastor, you know, whenever, whenever Pastor Jim, young Pastor Jim, uh, he's always going to be talking about corporate prayer. Have you ever heard him give a message without 
admonishing the people to participate in corporate prayer. Why does he always do that? Why does he just leave us alone? What's his problem? You don't want to be found complaining against the leadership that God's given to you, do you? Or like we were sharing some this morning, you know, the husband that's a jerk, you know? I mean, if he'd just be smart enough to recognize that he's not half as intelligent as I am, we could get something done in this household. That's corrupt communication that should be given no place whatsoever. Amen? Amen. Amen. That which is good to the use of edifying. You know, I see we're, we're, we're starting to run out of time. We're not done yet, but <clears throat> let's take a look at just a, a couple. We'll look, at, um, we'll look at a couple from your, uh, your teachings this past week, or your readings from this past week. Good there? Uh, go with me over to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. Some of you have read Acts 27 this past week. Hold fast to a profession of faith without wavering. I believed, therefore have I spoken. Amen? In Acts 27, they're on a ship in the Adriatic, being tossed about. This is where, you know, they've not seen sun or stars for 14 days. Good there? In verse 21 of Acts 27 reads, but after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, this is good, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not to have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. That's a good, bold declaration of faith, isn't it? I believe God. I believe God. Uh, Paul was on the same ship as all these other guys. And all hope that they'd be, they'd be saved has been lost. They didn't, eat, they didn't see sun or stars for 14 days. Hadn't eaten for 14 days. Well, a few more days would maybe go by. But, but they're, they're hopelessly being tossed about, aren't they? Yeah. And Paul says... <clears throat> Man of God, an angel of the Lord appeared to me and said, you're going to appear before Caesar and all those that are on the boat with you <clears throat> will be spared. Isn't that great? Yeah. And he stands up and says what? I believe God. I believe God. Can't we do that in adverse circumstances? Can't we look beyond the circumstances and say, I believe God. I believe God. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, we've, uh, we've had it hard. And, uh, and frankly, you know, it's been a long time since we've seen the sun. But I believe God. He's the same. He's unfailing. God is faithful. We know that adversity comes. And don't, don't make excuses for... Uh, the, the, the criticism or the negativity uh, with a but. If we do so, then we're saying that that but is bigger than God. Right? Well, uh, things would be fine. Listen, I'm not, I'm not you know, <clears throat> it, it, it's just that uh, I'm, I'm trying my best. In circumstances, I know God could if it weren't for this individual. This individual. So what have we just made uh, but that individual more powerful than God? Right? Right? 
I mean, things could be okay if, if, if it wasn't for this, this person here. But that means that that person is capable of keeping God from getting you what he wants you to have. Is that really what we believe? Because that's what you just said you believed. When you say that, that yep, uh, if only this person weren't here, a part of my life, interfering. Are they really that powerful? Is God, does, does God really find himself with his hands tied? I to think how we can get this guy out of the way so I can get my people the blessing that I really want them to have. I mean, because that's what we're saying. That's the predicament that God is, has found himself in. And we're not saying God's a bad God, he's a good God. He would do what he could if. Yep. So I'm not going to say God's a bad God. I know he loves me, he cares for me. Yep. It's just this person that is more powerful than God. And that's what we have to conclude it. Paul, in adverse circumstances, says, I believe God. I believe God. I believe God is, is well able. Well able to do exceeding, abundantly. With him, nothing shall be impossible. Amen? Amen? Do we believe that? That's what we have got to stand on. That's what must be the profession <clears throat> of our lips. We hold fast to a profession of faith without wavering. And we don't look at these circumstances or that evil report or this individual or the, the, the clock ticking, uh, ticking by, the years going by, and no. It's Abraham, isn't it? Yep, father of faith. Barren, uh, you know, his wife's barren, and the, the years go by, and they, you know, months and years and decades, and... He held fast to a profession of faith without wavering. Didn't he? Didn't he? Yep. Being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Let that be the profession that we hold on to because it lines up with what God has said. All we're doing is saying what God has to say on the subject. I believe God. Say that with me. I believe God. And you insert in there or attach to that what you believe God for. That is, what God has said regarding whatever your situation might be. I believe God. And these are his words. These are the words that I hold to, stand on, profess, proclaim. I believe God. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise. You are our all in all. And while at any given time we all find ourselves tempted to look upon the circumstances and to lose heart, lose hope, maybe join the people around us that are complaining, that have lost hope. But if we give in, it was, it was a choice to do so. We're ever being encouraged by you to stand on your word, keep heart and mind stayed on you, and to declare what you've said. That's, you're always working in us and helping us and teaching us to hold fast to a profession of faith without wavering. You are faithful in all your promises. Heavenly Father, give us the strength. Help us to hear and listen to what's coming out of our mouths. And if it doesn't line up with what is written, may we be swift to repent Declare, to declare that we believe God. 
Let us hear your voice clearly through all the clamor and all the complaints that might be around us at any given time. And let us lift our voices in confident declaration. God is able. My God shall provide. I can do all things through Christ. Help us, O Lord God, to hold fast to a profession of faith without wavering. You are faithful who has promised. We trust you for that grace, O Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you believe God? Yes. Let me hear you say so. I believe God. I believe God. I believe God. So do I. Be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord. God's grace and peace go with you all.